ועוד לדבר למיקרופון כזה. תודה שבאתם. בסך הכל מבחינת לוגיסטיקה, אני רוצה לפתוח בהתנצלות לכל מי שנרשם או רצה להירשם ובאיזשהו שלב סגרנו את המקומות, כי באמת ניסינו לעשות את זה קצת יותר אינטימי, ועדיין נרשמו הרבה, עדיין נתנו להירשם להרבה מעבר. בסך הכל הסמינר הזה מיועד יותר לארכיטקטים, וזאת הסיבה שגם לא שמנו את זה באתר מייקרוסופט ופרסמנו את זה לכולם. אני קצת אציג את עצמי למי שעדיין לא יצא לו לראות אותי או לא יצא לו להכיר אותי. אני, לי קוראים אליאז טוביאס ואני יועץ ארכיטקטורה דודנט במייקרוסופט. אני חושב שיש לי הרבה כובעים, כרגע לא רואים אותם, אבל הכובע אני חושב שהוא הכי מאתגר או הכי מרתק. שבו אני באמת חושב שיש אפשרות לעשות פה איזשהו שינוי בתעשיית ההייטק בארץ, זה הכובע של עבודה מול ארכיטקטים. הנושא הזה של עבודה מול ארכיטקטים זה משהו שאפשר להגדיר אותו בכל מיני צורות. אני חושב שבגדול אפשר לחלק את זה לשניים. קודם כל להביא למודעות של מקבלי החלטות בארגונים שצריך תפקיד כזה של ארכיטקט, מישהו שבאמת ידאג לזה שלא עושים עוד פעם את אותו דבר ושיש באמת מישהו שעושה את האורכסטרציה בין הגופים השונים. ומצד שני לעשות פעילויות כמו הפעילויות שאנחנו רואים, כמו שאנחנו עושים היום ומחר, שזה באמת לתת תכנים והסמכות והכשרות לאותם ארכיטקטים. זאת אומרת, זה נחמד שנבנה את, ה, את המודעות, אבל צריך גם לעזור ש, שיהיה, את ה, שיהיה את הכלים לאותם ארכיטקטים לעשות את העבודה שלהם. עכשיו, אי אפשר להגיד ארכיטקטורה בלי להגיד את הצמד מילים של Web Services, או הטריפל של המילים של... Service Oriented Architecture, זאת אומרת, אנחנו כבר, זה הפך להיות פחות או יותר המילה הנרדפת לכל, לכל דבר שנוגע איכשהו בארכיטקטורה בשנים האחרונות. אני רוצה להאמין שביומיים האלה באמת נצליח לשפוך קצת טוב על, ה, על הנושאים האלה, לראות את זה מכיוונים אחרים. בסך הכל אני שמח שבאמת, אולי בשלב הזה אני אעבור לאנגלית, I'm transfer to English for, for our guests. I'd like to welcome Clemens Vasters and uh, Akim Hulos. I pronounced it well. I tried yesterday, I asked him how to pronounce it, so I hope it was okay. You had the chance to, to correct me. Um, thank you for coming to Israel, uh, being with us and sharing uh, your thoughts about uh, SOA and uh, web services. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, I just need to open another file, and there it is, because I may need it later. Hello, my name is Kenneth Fastas, I'm CTO of New Intelligence AG, I'm also Microsoft Regional Director for Germany, Microsoft Solution Architect, MVP, all the uh, orders and uh, badges of honor that you get if you're pretty loud. Um, also Marx is a certified architect, one of the few, and that's not because I'm very special, but that's because the program doesn't scale yet. Um, so that's a certification that's very interesting if you want to look at the Microsoft training website and just find out what that is all about. It's a very interesting thing. Um, I'm very happy that my Windows desktop search indexing is now complete, which means that we can proceed without further delay. Um, and before I even say anything special about what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to make a statement by redecorating the place, okay? <clears throat> so let's just take this here and just hide it for a little bit. Because we're talking about service orientation, right? There's a huge hype word running, floating around that service-oriented architecture. And I had a meeting yesterday with uh, the Microsoft Architects Council, which is uh, the Council of Partners, our partner architects, uh, who got invited and uh, they asked me to do a little talk and uh, I tried to separate out what service orientation, service oriented architecture means and that service oriented architecture really means many things to many people by now because marketing got involved, right? So first, of, first, technical people started out and say we need to have something to describe our ideas which are a little different from objects. And then they were thinking hard, figuring out a term, what they should use. And they came out with a 
problematic phrase in the service. And so they thought, well, you know, we shall all no longer write object-oriented applications, but rather service-oriented applications. That's the motivation, the technical motivation. Then came the marketing people and the business people and heard the term, liked it, and thought of it in completely different ways. So now we have service-oriented architecture, and all of a sudden you can buy hardware devices that improve your SOA. Right? What do they do? Interesting. You can buy all sorts of different all sorts of different things that are software which improve your SOA. So what's that supposed to be? It's an interesting thing that you when when I read the trade press, it's you read how things improve SOA and how Im organizations implement their SOA, and you read it reads like everybody has found the uh, the perfect solution to every everything, and everybody's totally happy, and you know they've just reinvented their world, and now everybody's curious how did they do it. My arg my argument and my um, uh, thesis is they don't. Well, let's see. This is mostly about, so the introduction I'm having here is about service orientation, what service orientation means. Uh, it's about the so-called four tenets of service orientation, uh, of which one, some are more important, some are less important, as you'll see. And it's also about the difference between SOA and SO and all those things. So let's get started. Um, this session, I'm going to talk about motivation for service-oriented systems, why that's, re uh, why that's relevant, why you would like to um, implement systems in a service-oriented way, why you want to implement systems in a message-oriented way, um, the core principles of services, and then in the further sessions, today and tomorrow, we're going to go into all the different aspects. We're going to talk about edges, we're going to talk about autonomy, we're going to talk about um, patterns and all sorts of different things um, to shed light on the various aspects of what service orientation means. And well, of course, of course, we'll also discuss a little more the the business aspects of this, the specific technical aspects of this. But I trust that you will find some some rather interesting results. And I, I would I would like to clarify all that marketing all that marketing stuff. So, I have some hope that this works. And it worked for the first slide. There's no reason why it shouldn't work for the second. See? <laughs> ah, it's distance sensitive. Okay, I have to do it by hand. Alright, so, as a it has been working. Now this this worries me. See, now it works. <laughs> we'll we'll see how it continues. Probably have to have to push harder. Okay. So as a prologue, let's think about some architecture domains. We have software architects and software designers. These people structure the internal technical details of an application, guide developers implementing applications. These are these are people who are with you know both feet in the code probably with both, both legs too, and they understand exactly how things are. Typically, you know, the smartest guy on the development team and he plays the role of the architect. Um, the software architecture domain is pretty new and is not very well defined. Um, if you have some people who call themselves architects who have hardly any idea of current technology. They used to have a good idea of technology 20 years ago, right? But now they're mostly managers. And they, they negotiate with vendors, they understand the big picture, and these people are taking different roles than the people who are actually building software, who are guiding developers, who are probably reviewing code and doing all those things. These are software architects and software designers. Then there are solution architects. A solution architect takes a business set of business requirements, works with the business analysts, and they will figure out, try to figure out a solution. 
These are people who are not as deep in the code, but who are transforming that business demand into something that works. These people organize projects, they gather together a team, they, get, they guide that team. They're not necessarily the people who fill out the, the, the project plan, right? These are project managers, different people. But these are sort of the, guide, the, the, the guidance people around a large solution. Define and select the components, meaning they also say, you know, we're going to use application block X for this, and we're going to use the following subsystem. Let's just say we're going to use BizTalk, or we're not going to use BizTalk. Something like this. Then we have, this is sketchy. Then we have enterprise architects. The enterprise architects are the people I just talked about. Are strategists, IT strategists on a CIO, CTO level, or slightly below it, reporting to the CIO, CTO, because it depends on the split that you have in the, in the organization. Sometimes the CIO, CTO is really a guy who's, who's caring more about money than about anything else. Uh, and they set the overall strat strategic technology direction for a solution. And then in the end, you have business analysts. All those people, all those four roles, and of course, this is just an overview. I, we, I could go on and on and on and just split it up. And there's very, very many different roles in architecture. Um, I would say that the user experience architect who's designing, who's architecting the user interface for a large solution, that's an architect too. Right? So that's more in the software architect domain. Uh, infrastructure architects are people that are completely left out of this picture because we, write, we talk about development here. There's very many architects. If, you, if, if people just say, I'm an architect, that's just as much as say as I'm a programmer. Typically, people are more specific about this. They say, I'm a solution programmer. I use this, this language. They identify with, with, with the language. They identify with the tool. Here, you identify more with your role. Now, all those four roles have a different perception of what service orientation means to them. And, but everybody's talking about the same thing, and that is causing big trouble. That's causing big trouble for everybody understanding what things are, are about. And it's causing big trouble for you know, people explaining those things. And uh, it doesn't help to clarify the whole picture. So I just want to make this clear that part of the confusion about service orientation comes from those different roles and simply different viewpoints that people have. So what does that mean? SO or SOA, service oriented architecture and codes. That's why that's what I'm covering this up. For an enterprise architect and a business analyst, service-oriented architecture means to align business functions with technology and to do so both ways. That is their goal. Their goal is to say, we have an accounting department. The accounting department has the ability to take a receipt that you have or, or an invoice that you have and book it into an account. Right? That's a business function that the accounting department provides. Um, you have a, um, an, invent, an inventory department right, that manages all the goods that you have. And their function is that you can tell them to take something out of the inventory and ship it to a customer. <coughs> That's a business function that they have. The goal here that a, an enterprise architect and the business analyst have and which they make a requirement from the software people is to have that exact business function to be reflected in the software solution to make an alignment. That's what they think. That's what they're concerned about. At least that's what I hear. For solution architects and software designers, it's a completely different story. SOA is not about software architecture at all. For for solution architects, for software designers, this is more about implementation guidance. It's about how you write systems right. But the fundamental, fundamental architectural truth that we all know, and which I'm going to illustrate even further, doesn't really change through this. We've been building pop sub systems. We've been building queuing systems. We've been building three tier systems. We've been building all sorts of, you know, we're building now because we listen to the, the great people in you know, all those big companies. We're building smart client solutions with online, offline application blocks and all those things. 
Do you really need service orientation? Do you need XML for that? No, we haven't and we don't. The interesting thing is that service-oriented architecture brings nothing new to the table in terms of architecture. It brings us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we can implement things. It brings us certainly a lot more problems in certain ways how we have to make things more explicit so it's more work in, in points, right? And it gives us more um, opportunities to connect to other systems. So it makes it easier to write distributed systems, but in terms of architectural thinking, in terms of architectural uh, tools that you have in your hands, there are very, very few things that are really new. That's not a, it's not a revolution, even if someone wants to tell, sell you that, that as, a, uh, as, as a revolution. It's a clear evolution and everything that you know about building distributed systems uh, building systems that connect across multiple computers, uh, all that you know about this stays true. And that's a good thing, that's actually by intent. So the SO in service orientation is not the SO in service oriented architecture. You hear Microsoft, uh, especially the people who own the distributed systems technologies, the Distributed Systems Group, or now Connected Systems Division, uh, who also own uh, Indigo. They're also well known as the Indigo team. Uh, that team also owns uh, ASP.NET Web Services, the Web Service Enhancements, Remoting, Enterprise Services. So in short, everything that talks from, from the .NET framework, um, actually from Windows, because they also own RPC, they own all the unmanaged stacks too. And that team, speaks about so service orientation in this sense, because they're about IT infrastructure. They're about building tools. Um, everybody else out there in the world may more be speaking about service-oriented architecture because they need to talk, and if you read this in the press, you always need to, need to keep in mind that the marketing departments speak to the wallet. Right? They speak to the wallet in the way that they want to get money out of that wallet. And getting money out of the wallet means you need to speak about business, benefit in, in terms of money, right? Saving money, reducing cost, and all those things. If you say, oh, it's a lot easier for us with XML to link between JAX and ASMX, it means zip to, any, to anybody who has a wallet. So, that's the problem. That's the problem in this space. So much as for the prologue. So the goal of this workshop is to speak primarily about software architecture and not about business process engineering. That's mostly because I have very little uh, knowledge of business process engineering that would be uh, good enough to speak in front of 150 people. Right? You would, there's probably some of you who could actually teach me something there. Um, so I'm going to be talking about software architecture. This is, and Achim is going to talk about software architecture too. So this is mostly about uh, the solution architect and the software designer and software, and software architect angle. Not about the, the other angle. That's why I have a problem with service oriented architecture per se as it is defined, as the definitions have emerged. Um, we're going to highlight what service orientation means. Uh, we're going to investigate how that benefits ISVs and corporate software developers. So for us, service means it's a software function. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be, can't be business aligned. Right? That's not what that means. It's just that we leave out all the marketing <coughs> business angle for the time being. And then we can come back to it, we can discuss it of course um, later. We'll touch it, it's our primary focus. All right, so let's start with the motivations for service orientation. Why would we want to do that? There's uh, several requirements that we have. This is the world that most applications live in. There's, um, at least in the corporate environment, there's ERP systems, CRM systems, 
and uh, some custom applications. And custom applications is mostly what developers are concerned, unless they are at ISVs who build ERP and CRM systems, of course. Um, ERP and CRM systems are commonly found in most organizations, and that's so because that's you know, customers is something that everybody hopefully has, unless you're a startup and you're still hoping for some. And uh, ERP systems is you know all that horrible stuff that you need to do in terms of accounting, getting the numbers right, because in the end it's all about numbers. Uh, and then you have custom systems that cover your your day-to-day -day core business. Those systems need to be, should be integrated. Um, in many organizations, the integration is done, um, well, it all varies widely. Uh, sometimes integration is done by uh, through the clipboard, uh, which is not a good thing, but happens. Um, and so there's various degrees of integration between all those systems, information flow between those systems. It's not easy to do. <coughs> now that most of those systems are no longer, the systems vendors are no longer believing um, that their system is the only thing that the customer will ever need, right? It's not the only software they'll ever use. Um, integration becomes easier. But integration is required between all those systems. If you want, if you have your custom a custom <laughs> system that you that you use for selling stuff on the internet, for instance, right? You could have a shop solution, and that shop solution then integrates with the backend uh, ERP and accounting system. But maybe a custom built, or maybe a, a general purpose shop solution is not what you need. But you need, you need to build your own, your own website. Then you also need to integrate with those things. It turns out that um, a lot of money is spent on integrating systems without really adding value. Um, about 70% of all IT expense is spent on keeping systems running and integrating systems, not on, on investing in new functionality. That's a little bit much. Um, the average in the US, the average integration project bridges um, about six mission critical applications. Um, for the cost of at least 1.2 million dollars, uh, and that's just bridging. Integration cost is just too high. The issue with that is that we have a lot of mission critical systems. So let's take let's take as an example an organization of the size of <coughs> Boeing or General Motors or um, Daimler Chrysler or any of those, right? Multinational large companies. How many mission critical applications do those organizations run? 500, hmm? 1,000 is a, is a guess on the low side. It, it, looks, it looks like they're all run between three, five, and 8,000. So somewhere in that range. It, it, and that depends mostly on um, how on whether they have already discovered that that's a problem. Uh, because there's, and there's, there's a movement, and you can look this up in Google, called application scaling, um, or downscaling. And that's reduce the number of mission critical apps. Mind that, mission critical doesn't mean that it runs on a ZOS IBM mainframe in the basement, right? Mission critical merely means that if this app is not available, a part of the business can't function. In uh, very many investment banking houses around the world, um, if you would take away Excel, so if, if Microsoft, let's, let's say Microsoft would ship a patch to Excel for security purposes that makes Excel dysfunctional. Let's, let's take that, right? Everything can happen. <coughs> The whole world of investment would collapse in a day. That's how important Excel is. And that's how mission critical it is. We have a customer who's currently running a project for the decision support system where they are writing for the first time a decision support app. It's a well-known German investment house. Until now, decision support has been done entirely in Excel. They have one guy working for two, one and a half years to figure out what all the analysts did in Excel, to actually take this out of Excel and put this into a, into a real app. 
because they can't maintain it. They can't integrate it with anything. This is one of the most costly uh, uh, IT disasters that they have because everybody's programming their own solutions. That stuff, that also needs to be integrated with that. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough place to be, to be integrating. And so to be able to integrate, you need to have some openness, you need to have some ways to be integratable. Every piece needs to be, needs to be integratable. We have recognized that there's a problem, so now we need to have a way to fix that problem permanently. We can't stop writing software, right? But we have to write software in a way that we make it more integratable. But that's not all. We have, our software has broader reach. Right? We have, of course, we have public web portals, internet portals, and, and client applications uh, out there, and that's, um, that's being done for a long time now. We have branch networks that need to connect out to those things. Um, and that's happening more and more. You have smart client apps, you have browser-based browser apps, and that's, that's increasing. You have more um, applications with further reach, but then the reach continues in that people actually get mobile. They cut the wire to their application, so to speak, and take the application on the road. We have applications that work, that must work online and offline. Another customer of ours um, is uh, an insurance, and they have applications that, of course, that insurance agents need to, need to take with them on the road. They've been testing in a country as well equipped with wireless technology as Germany, whether they could actually use GPRS or UMTS to have you know, a permanent, always-on network capability. The result is they can't. They have 20% of 20 customers uh, in rural areas they can't reach, which is impossible. So it's impossible for them to have an entire online app. Thin client is a nice thought, but in practice, if you don't have desktops, if you don't have everybody sitting in your organization at their places, if you have people who are roaming around, think client doesn't work, right? So all of a sudden you need to have something that's a client application, that's a smart client, then you need to connect that thing. You need to build it in a way that you can fully function, that the application can fully function without, having, without seeing its backend server for two days. You need to have an application that fully functions if someone sits in a train in you know, the middle of, uh, of Germany or in Switzerland, right? Sitting on a train having a UMTS or GPRS connection, but the train goes through a tunnel every two minutes with no connection. You need to build your app in a reliable fashion. You need to build applications that work with latencies that you experience if you sit on a Lufthansa or SAS plane from, let's say, Copenhagen to Seattle or from Frankfurt to Denver, right? I want to work and you need to deal with latencies that occur if you sit on the plane, you go with an internet connection up to a satellite and back, and are relayed through all sorts of different stations, uh, latency times of three, four seconds um, for the signal to go one way. You need to deal with situations that people actually go on planes <coughs> and don't fly SAS or Lufthansa, and don't have internet capability, right? as most of us still. So you need to deal with all those, all those situations. And then we have all those little mobile phones that can run applications and the pressure is growing to deliver at least some applications on those mobile phones. And as much as Microsoft tries, right, on the desktop we can say, you know, just use Windows because it seems like a plausible option to use Windows on the desktop. There's other opinions and that's fine, right? But it's a plausible option to use Windows. And if you are using one of the alternatives, you can still use Wine to make applica Windows applications work, right? On the mobile devices, that's not as clear cut <coughs> because Windows is trying to play catch up with Nokia and Nokia is not doing bad. So all of a sudden you're talking cross-platform on that platform that really matters. Right? Mobile devices are, more people have mobile devices in their hands than people are having PCs. Um, that's the clear application development platform right there. And Windows smartphone is a wonderful thing, 
right? It's fun. Uh, it works really well, and you can deploy it. You can't, however, as a practical person, pragmatic person, you can't ignore the fact that you'll have to write a little Java to make all those Nokia, Nokia devices work. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a cross-platform situation. Unless, unless, it's okay for you to just say, all right, we're not going to buy the phones that we get from our provider, but we're going to just buy 4,000 Windows smartphones and just distribute them to, to our users, right? That's a, that's a great option, too. But especially mobility and this integration story, the heterogeneity that comes with it is something that is creating problems. Oh, one more word on heterogeneity. Um, I am only in limited ways a, a fan of you know, big strategy in corporate IT. Um, if someone says, we will do everything in J2EE, Right? We, have, we, we are making a strategic decision for WebSphere. That's fine. Right? And the argument is very simple. All developers are trained for it. Um, all our operation services, people know it, etc., etc., etc. However, these are all IT arguments, which in the end can't count. And now I'm coming back to the business angle. Uh, one department will find, inev almost inevitably, on today's software market. It doesn't matter whether your corporate strategy is .NET, or whether your corporate strategy is J2EU, or whether your corporate strategy is something completely different. If your shop, if your, your organization is big enough, an organization, a department will come along and say, I found this solution X, which handles 90% of the things that we're doing, or 95, or even 100, it's the perfect fit for us, however, it works on the other platform. Not taking that application into your application uh, portfolio is just flat out stupid. And it's something that, you can't, that can't be sold to the business users. It is the wrong thing to do. If you don't have people who can operate the thing, train them. That's as easy as it is. IT strategy cannot hinder the business in doing things. So, a strategy is good, right? You say everything that we develop ourselves is going to be on that platform, but heterogeneity is something that you can't avoid if you really want to add value to the business and not produce unnecessary costs. Why would you want to develop an application yourself if you can buy one on the market um, and save all the development costs? I don't see much of a reason for it. You make a preference for a platform, but that's not ex no exclusive claim. Heterogeneity is a reality, and the vendors are working to make it easier for you to, to integrate, but it's not an exclusive thing. So there's integration mandate. The integration mandate is something that we need to follow, that we, building, all of us building applications need to follow. Um, one, the, one of the bigger problems, one of the bigger problems in that space is um, that in this industry, there's a lot, there's a lot of egos, a lot of very big egos, and everybody thinks, at least every organization, every sensible software development organization thinks they're the best in the world, and that's fine. <coughs> However. We should simply stop believing that our framework, like the, the, the Phoenix framework that I'm building right now, I'm not, but let's assume, the Phoenix framework that I'm building right now, named Phoenix because everything we had before was crap, and now out of the ashes rises the wonderful new Phoenix framework, right? That thing is the only business framework that anybody would ever need. Therefore, I'm building a plugin model that everybody can plug into. Right? I'm writing the universal business desktop solution. Everybody can plug into this. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write an address management system and um, a customer shell. Uh, so I have a customer information system that other people can plug their stuff into. And that's a great platform. And then we can plug our services into that, and other vendors can plug their services into that as well. 
Does that sound familiar to anybody? Right. It turns out 450,000 different companies do that. And of those 450,000 companies who are doing this, um, very few to none succeed. And most of the companies doing that are not actually platform vendors, but they have solutions. They should be doing that. You can build your solution, and that's wonderful, wonderful and fine. But building a, you know, the silo, the integration focal integration point for everything, that's pipe dream. That's not working. At least I have yet to see it working. If you're SAP, uh, maybe. But then again, there's a lot of solutions apparently not using SAP's framework. With that comes a very unfortunate stance, and that's this data is mine. Appli data is very often buried deeply within an application. You can't get at it except through the, the UI of the app, uh, the UI of the app, and probably by hacking the database right away. But that's the only way to get at it. That makes integration really hard. Because it's not exposed, it's not documented, there's no way to get at the data. It turns out that you may have a really great accounting engine, but your user interface, frankly, sucks. Right? Because you have a lot of talent in the space of doing the numbers right, and you have zero talent in doing the user interface right. And we've all seen those applications. So why aren't you making your application core available as a programmable thing and let other, write, other people write alternative UIs to yours. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think so. That would expose the functionality of your application, the data of your applications, to others. And it would also be nice if your application would not only work on the desktop, but actually in a distributed fashion. So you can integrate it in a distributed system. And all of a sudden we're talking about a whole different, a whole, wholly different concept of software. Does, the, is the definition of application such that you need to open a window and see it? And my argument is, no. It can very well just be running as a service and you give other people a manual and say, you know, write a UI for it. Use data binding and just make your day. That's fine. For me, that's perfectly reasonable. Because and, and we'll, we're going to get to that place. It turns out that there's a lot of people who have a lot of intelligence in the field of user interface design. <clears throat> Apparently, none of those people work in software companies. All those people work in advertising agencies. And there's something wrong to that. Maybe we can get the advertising agencies. Here's an idea, right? Maybe you can get the advertising agencies to the point that they write user interfaces. Maybe we can actually start companies which specialize in user interface design for applications and hire away all those designers. <coughs> Maybe. I think we're going to get to the, we, we should get to a place where user where the user experience is different from the application. That all has to do with integratability, with the willingness to open up your apps, with the willingness to, to redefine the way applications work to define services. This also has to do with making information more accessible to users. My girlfriend is a nurse. She's managing the private ward of a hospital, an orthopedic clinic. Uh, and um, she is responsible for accepting people into the ward you know, for um, the beds, and uh, so she's managing all, all the computer work, paperwork. She needs to enter every patient into four different applications. I've, I've seen this, I've, oops, what's that? It was, was this blue or was this green? I have no power. And the question is, why is that?
No, I've already. No, you know, it's a little. Right. Sorry. A little technical hiccup here. Sabine was the topic. Okay. If this is, see, this is an audience participation on the book. If this puppy here turns blue, it means it's on battery. Battery currently very low. Meaning that actually I should probably back, I should probably use the backup battery. <laughs> These are pretty evil bricks. To get with those batteries through Israeli airport security <laughs> is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to Sabine. So Sabine has to enter the, uh, this stuff into uh, many applications, uh, four applications to be precise, and she has to log in through the way they set this up, the IT department where she works, is a complete nightmare. She's she's logging into her into Citrix, which is not a bad thing per se. And then from there she has to log on from that Citrix box to another Citrix box to do so tunneling basically to do one thing. Um, and that's a smart client app. Not precisely, but it's a client app. <laughs> and then on the other Citrix account, she needs to log in in four different ways to, and, and that's again, a cascading login, uh, to a web app and then to another web app. Those people, so first of all, those people have no skills, right? That's obvious. However, even if that was done right, which it isn't, um, it, it, this fact will still stand that she has to enter the data into four different apps. Because they don't understand integration at all. Now, when you ask them, which of course, um, I gave her a little bit of a, of a set of questions, right? And said, when you have, because she had a meeting with, with those people, she was one of the, the people to actually you know, give them the requirements and said, all right, ask them this and this and this. And they came back with, um, that's not our priority, um, that's also important, and so they were basically just setting this off. The point is, you know, that's causing a lot more work. Um, it's error prone, and it's just not right. All those apps haven't been written to integrate. They have no concept of, of integration whatsoever, and that's wrong, and that's causing real pain. This is costing, I would, my estimate is, this is costing per patient about 20 minutes more than it really needs to. And that's a lot in a hospital. That's a lot. That's a lot of cost, and it's completely unnecessary. Just because, and it just that's a purely and only a fall of IT. And when I see that, I'm very sorry for all those users out there, because that can't be the only case. I'm sure people have to suffer through more horrible things. No single application will ever cover all requirements. There's room apparently for multiple thousand mission critical apps in, in a larger enterprise. Mm -hmm. And if you look if you work in a smaller company you know how many applications you need. Right? There's multiple, it's not only one. No single application can manage all data, yet no user can or wants to know where those things are. Why does the user have to know which application he needs he or she needs to open for a particular thing to see a particular piece of data? Isn't that really the job of the user interface? Isn't that really the job of one menu, if you will, what we call it like this, one search screen to actually integrate and gather the data? I think that's the job. Integration doesn't only mean to click together with WSDL and web services and all those things, software systems, but it also means to click them together where the user is. That's one of my that's that's one of my concerns, right? Integration will never work, and and all this wonderful the wonderful blessings of service orientation that we're going to talk to you about will never work 
if we're not willing to give up the monopoly on the desktop, if we're not willing to, to give up monopolizing the user experience, but are willing to say, all right, integration must start there because that's what, what makes it easier for the users. That's one of the goals. That is easier to achieve if every business function or every software function is exposed in a programmable way and can be accessed across the network. If we're building services. Building services, building integratable systems opens the door for building systems that are finally user friendly, user oriented, that help users with the services they render towards the organization and towards their customers, that are aligned with the business functions. Because that's exactly where that goes. Admit customer into station in the hospital. That's a business function. Why do I have to do 450,000 different things to actually make that work as a user? It doesn't make sense. I want to fill in two screens. Screen one, next. Screen two, finish, done. The rest is the job of the IT. If they need four different apps, <coughs> fine. Let them have it. Let me consolidate all the information that I need for all those four different apps onto two screens. Press finish, distribute the data, happy. That's what I need. That's the sort of integration that matters to the end users. If the end users are happy, the money keeps flowing. And that's important to us. Because otherwise, all those questions, what's the status of my business, how are we doing, it's just, are, just too important, are just too costly to ask. And that's something we don't want. So integration is a business imperative. So what's the service? I'm going to give you a more, a more precise definition, which is not going to look much different um, in a little bit. A service, in the sense of software, <coughs> of service orientation, is first a little thing, a piece of software that exposes some capability of an application. There's an application, an application means the, the full definition of application is, of course, Application is a strange word, right? Application of Microsoft Windows to the problem of accounting. Application of Red Hat Linux to the problem of selling books on the internet. Okay? That's what application means. Application is specific tool set, specific solu solution field. That's an application. I apply technology to solve a certain problem. Certain technology to certain problem. There's a bunch of technologies and a lot of problems, and you take the fitting tool to, um, to solve this solution, and then you need to bridge them. Those capabilities of those specific applications are exposed through services. Typically, those services allow programmatic access. But then again, what is programmatic access? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a funny thing. If you have a service that you can open a TCP port to, right? now I'm getting really technical here, that you can open a TCP port to, and you shout text through that TCP port, and you, write, and you shout HTTP slash 1.1 space get space slash Carriage return line feed. Carriage return line feed. Is that programming? Is that programmable access? And now that we wait a little bit, the server shouts back, hey, HTTP slash 1.1 space 200 space, okay. Carriage return line feed. Content dash type colon text slash HTML carriage return line feed. Content dash size colon some wacky number carriage return line feed. Carriage return line feed. Anger bracket open HTML blah 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 blah. Is that a service? Well, sure it is. 
I've executed a method. The HTTP method get. Now assume that it would be a form on that page. I fill out that form. I press the button. I open up a socket and I shout HTTP slash 1.1 post slash index.htm character return line feed content dash type colon x dash application slash ww url form encoded character return line feed character return line feed form field one equals clemens ampersand form field two equals caution wall character return line feed that's service invocation. That's a form post. It's not so. It's not about so. It's perfectly fine to just send H to just send XML content around, to send HTML content, to send anything around. These are all programmable services. These are there are differences just in the in the type of edge technology that we're using. Sometimes we're using plain HTML, plain, uh, plain HTML, and just HTTP as the method. Sometimes we're tunneling information through HTTP, through HTTP and are, some say, app using the application level protocol HTTP as a transport protocol. It is not at all, it's not at all about so and XML. Web services or services in general, service-oriented thinking has nothing to do with the concrete edge technology that we're using. It is as much a, a way of thinking about, about software as it is with object orientation. Object orientation you can do with plain C, you can write assembly based object oriented programming, even though it's very painful. You can write them in small talk, you can write them in objective, objective C, you can write them in all sorts of different languages. So object orientation is not language dependent. Language dependent as much as service orientation is not edge technology dependent. Some say it's the web's new clothes. That's what I just that's what I just what I just talked about is some people say HTTP is the last protocol the world will ever need. Right? I dispute that claim. Um, I think HTTP will, will have a reduced role in the future, it will not be as predominant as it was. Uh, but that will take some time. Uh, some say HTTP is good enough, so let's just you know forget about the whole HTML web and let's set XML around. People are doing this very successfully. Um, for instance, Udi here, right, is one of the, it had to happen, you know. <laughs> Woody here is, 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 is probably the most, the most visible, at least to me, uh, uh, but that, that's just my perception, uh, the most visible distributed systems blogger in Israel. Right? He is using part of this revolutionary web 2.0 stuff, which is RSS. Right? RSS is a simple XML format um, that's not using SOAP at all. That even that doesn't even have a proper schema. RSS is to be very clear, a horrible, very bad. You know, let me not use all the swear words that it deserves. Specification. It is it is a complete nightmare. Yet people are using it. And you walk up to an RSS endpoint. You go to say HTTP GET, and you get some XML instead of getting the normal HTML that people will give you. And there we are, we have a completely different way of interacting because RSS is of course a very popular thing. OPML is just the same, it's probably the worst specification. Um, but these are different types of applications. These are XML data applications which are delivered by means of the web, but they're not the web, right? The web is HTML, hypertext markup language. And these are not hypertext, these are just custom application specific XML things in which you can discover other links, but it's not the same thing, it's not the web, it's a similar technology stack. 
living side by side with the web. And you probably link link to it, but then try clicking on an XML page in Firefox or in, in IE. You can't. Some say it's about XML and SOAP and Whistle, and already, you know, that's not true. XML and SOAP and Whistle play a huge role in the web services space, <laughs> without any doubt. But they are not the only thing in the web services space or in the services space. They, SOAP is the most important format to wrap data in. There's no doubt about this. Um, WC dressing, which you're going to learn about in much detail, is certainly the most important messaging specification existing. <coughs> WC dressing and SOAP go together. Right? WC dressing is, is the twin of SOAP, if you like. The importance, they can't live without each other. Some say, that, you know, this is all not so important, it's all about evolution and coupling and making applications loose or coupled. And that's their stress. And some say it's purely about architecture. See, it's different, again, different viewpoints and how you look, how you look at it. And really, it's a bit of, of all of this. So, let's look at the base tenets of service orientation. I was in, uh, Achim and I were in Jerusalem yesterday. And uh, there, there's, there's one corner in, we, we, we've called it a, uh, a bazaar with associated religious sites, right? So we're, so we're, we're, walking, we're walking through Old Town and there's uh, a bunch of those t-shirt shops. And <laughs> one of was uh, like three laughing guys and the subline was Peace in the Middle East. Which was interesting. Anyways, let's let's let me try to make peace in the Middle East. Um, Policy-based compatibility, explicit <coughs> boundaries, avoiding coupling, contract and schema exchange. Peace, just so you have something easy to remember, right? It doesn't have. Well, it has some site connotation here because we're trying to make peace between all those platforms, right? The order, the, this order is, is mine, it's not official, right? It's just purely mine, just for me to remember it easier. It's like acid in transactions. But while acid in transactions is, of course, very evil, right? Acid. I thought peace would be nice, so you can think of uh, white doves and, and all those wonderful things. Ladies in white clothes. All right, what does that mean, right? So remember peace, try to remember it. That's the guiding thing that we have, the peace tenets. So avoid coupling. I, I reordered them for the purpose of explanation, though. Because it turns out the first one, the P, is not as important as the other ones. We're going to get to it. Avoid coupling. Avoid cou coupling and autonomous teams. Services control their own contract. More precisely, the people who are writing those services control the contract of the service. Contract meaning, I'm going to elaborate on that in, in much more detail uh, later. Contract meaning, here's what you're going to get. Here's what you need to send me, here's what you're going to get. That's contract. I sit down with you, or I give you a document which outlines very clearly what I'm going to do, right? how long I'm going to support that, um, whether you can rely on me or not, as I'm just kind of giving you giving you a document, um, or we sit down and negotiate a document, and that says this is the data you're going to get, uh, this is what I'm going to do with that data, and this is the data you get back. That's contract. The service author, the service owner, the team owning that service is completely <coughs> at freedom to change, to evolve contract at any given point in time. If they want to add a parameter to a function, fine. If they want to add two fields to a data structure, go right ahead. That's the autonomy they enjoy. Because if you don't have autonomy in that sense, if you don't use technology in the way that you can't be autonomous, you find yourself in a situation that you have to recompile the world every time anybody is changing anything. The more, the more systems we connect, the less 
we can make ourselves dependent on details of others. We'll have to work to achieve this. The goal is, the goal is that we can, in, in fact, go and have a deployment. And this is something that large IT shops um, have. We can have a deployment where we are currently, let's say, we're rolling out a new application. Okay? We have version 1.1 out there. We have the version 1.2. Version 1.2 com comes with a considerable set of fixes, uh, new features, and updated data structures throughout. We've forgotten a few fields, so to speak. Right? You have 35,000. You have a. It's a smart client application with considerable backend server server um, uh, components. So let's say we have. 50 servers that we need to touch for this application to be working correctly, 50 different services, and we have 35,000 desktops that this application needs to be rolled out onto. And of the 35,000 desktops, we have 5,000 roaming, meaning people are working from their home office or they have notebooks. Have fun streaming that app if it's tightly coupled. You basically bring the shop down for a day. And that's the only thing you can do today. You, can, you need to take people completely offline and you say, you can't work until everything is completely upgraded. You have to lock people out today. If you're using something like remoting, or enterprise services, or Java RMI, or Corva even, you're done. You can't really make this change. With web services and doing it right, and this is something I'm going to show you tomorrow, uh, when I'm going to show you some actual code, um, you can actually make that work. You can have a 1.2 server talking to a 1.1 app, and you can have a 1.2 app talking to a 1.1 server without incurring data loss, which is the most important thing. Will you have all this functionality of the new functionality? No, of course not. But can you build the application so that it's tolerant against change, that you can Upgrade in a meaningful manner that you don't crash things, that you see things, that you see those those functions. Yes, you can. Loose coupling means not only loose coupling towards others, but most importantly, it also means loose coupling towards yourself. It turns out that one of the biggest challenges in programming is to be compatible, specifically wire compatible, to your own app. Try doing that. Try to be wire compatible. Take your favorite technology that you use, if it's not web services, and try to be wire compatible against a past version of your own application. It's almost impossible. Compatibility is not only to others, but it's also to yourself. This is one of the benefits of using the, these, these technologies. You make yourself versionable. You make yourself upgradable. You reduce your deployment problems. Services can evolve independent of others. That's a goal. That is, I don't need to talk to the other department. I don't need to wait for vendor A to upgrade their thing, if done right, to evolve my service to, to, to give more capabilities. Contract and schema exchange. We only exchange information by means of machine-readable contract. Machine-readable contract data. We do not share code. We do not share objects. Uh, we do not share binaries. Sharing means, in that sense, that's a very difficult thing. It, so in practice, what I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm finding is that this is not as clear-cut as it sounds. People typically understand this as, in the web services space, is give me your wisdom. Give me your WSDL, your web service definition language file, and your XML schema, and I will generate code from it for myself. That's how it's typically understood. However, for me, it's absolutely reasonable to compile an assembly, right? given that the other side works on .NET, to give them whistle and schema. That's fine. You can, they can have it. And to also compile an assembly with a proxy and give it to them and say, you can build this into your app. 
as long as they keep their private copy for themselves, and I can't update this, I can't touch this, I don't have to touch it, that proxy will work against my stuff, fine, even if I upgrade, that's a good thing. If I can, can give them source code in the form of C Sharp, VB, Java, anything, that is a, capable of talking to my service, that's fine too. There's a protocol called JSON, um, which is a way to invoke services remotely, where you can actually pull up a proxy. So you walk up to an endpoint, and this, the endpoint spits out JavaScript, and gives you the entire program necessary to talk to the other side. That's a wonderful thing too. That's also a contract. Contract is not XML or Whistle, it's not as clear cut. But what's important is that we do, do not make any binary direct dependency on the other side's code and on the other side's internal binary structure. That's the important part. So it is permissible to compile and give someone else an assembly as long as they get their private copy, which is independent of mine. And it still functions even though the other side completely recompiles their program and it looks different. What's not permissible is that two parts of an application are dependent on the same assembly sitting in the gap or on the same application sitting in the system 32 directory or on the same assembly, same class set sitting on the same class path in Java. That is not permissible. It is not permissible that two applications that are interoperating depend on the same build number and, and minor version number of that respective assembly. That is tightly coupling to the version, and that's something we don't want. But it's perfectly, it's perfectly fine to give someone binary, uh, uh, binaries to make their jobs easier. That's okay. That is still contract exchange. Now, contract exchange, so this is the sharing runtime specific semantic dependent types at the service edge. Um, this also means, this, this here is a very, very nicely crafted description for the .NET data set, right? The .NET data set, if you're a .NET developer, or you guide .NET developers, you're all architects, I understand. The .NET data set does not belong on a web service edge, meaning it's not, an, it's not a permissible argument, it's not a permissible return type. The data set is a wonderful tool for inside any service. It's a horrible idea to expose to the outside world. The reason for that is the data set exposed itself as any. Any in the sense of the XML schema expression, any. And the XML schema expression, any, means, ah, uh, that's going to be watch of XML. Which means that the other side has no idea what you're doing. Even worse, the data set puts itself on the wire as it just thinks it may be good to do at any given point in time. Sometimes it's a document. Sometimes it's a so-called diff grab. Who of you knows what a diff grab is? Right? Good? See the problem? Since so many of you don't know what a diff grab is, <coughs> it's probably not a standard thing. All right. It's probably another thing you can all all deal with. What a and I ask you, do you know what a data structure is? Right. I don't have. I don't. I apparently, don't have to ask the question unless the, there may be some marketing people in the room who probably don't, but everybody else does. And even the marketing people, at least at Microsoft, they do a little programming course and they have a little bit of an idea. So they even really know what it is. But to figure out what the diff gram is, that's hard. And you're, and you're exposing all that stuff to platforms, and that's, think about your Nokia smartphone solution that you will have to write, right? You have no data set on that Nokia phone. So how do you write something that talks to a diff gram? You can't. Or it's incredibly hard. You have to grab code of SourceForge to do that. Because, of course, people have fixed that problem. Because very many use the data set, but the data set is not a structure to do this because it's platform dependent. Explicitness of boundaries. That's the next tenet. That means 
it's visible when you make a call through the service boundary. When you go on the network, you can see that in your app. You don't say new on an object, make a call, and magically, through means of, co of configuration, right? One time it's called locally, and the other time it's called on the other machine. You don't new up an, an object, and all of a sudden that object is remote. You don't new up an object and set a property, and that property is magically set on the other side. That's not an explicit boundary. That's a floating boundary of, of uncertainty where stuff is. You new up a proxy, and that class is called like that. It's called so and so, so and so, so and so, so and so proxy, or so and so, so and so, so and so wizzy, whatever we call it. And that makes clear, whoops, uh, we're doing a network, a network boundary transition here. The point is, you have a wholly different set of exceptions that you're getting out of that class if you put a whole network stack in the middle of it. You get a whole different set of, of problems. All of a sudden, your zero latency call that happens from the stack on your local machine may be having latency if you happen to be on an airplane flying over Labrador uh, towards the US and you want to talk to your backend app, right? So calls can get costly. And this is something that's a, that's a very common thing that's very commonly seen in, in distributed apps, RMI apps, uh, in COM apps, or people happily develop on the local machine, um, or happily develop in a very tiny three people, four people network. <coughs> and then they go out into the real world, right? Uh, they're facing operations people, and the operations people say, um, you're causing a little too much traffic for my network, my friend. Because it hasn't been tested there, people haven't looked at it, and that's mostly because people just don't know how much traffic their applications do. Because it's unclear which object looks where, and you, you can't analyze how things are, right? I've seen I've seen massive applications being basically thrown away because it was impossible to run them on a reasonably on on on, on an app, just because they were built. It was co completely impossible to do the analysis post mortem of what what was running where, even by analyzing the config because. Is the lines were too blurry in the code. It was just all one thing. So explicit boundaries means it must be a little painful for the programmer to actually cross that boundary. They must see that. And there's an explicit notion of stuff that's written for the edge. You are not writing a public class, and that public means public for local use and public for external <coughs> use. Right? We have we need to have a different concept of public, where you say, all right. This is a public class, which can be publicly used by local programs, so we can link to it. But then if you want to use this application for the network, hmm, there's a bunch of public methods, which I don't want you to use. I want to use you two, three special methods, which I've designed specific, specifically for remote access. It may even be that you're shielding those remote access methods from the local callers by making them private, in terms of C-sharp or VB, or it's called Java, uh, but it's supposed to make them public for, the network, for network use. It's a different concept. Again, that's um, explicit of the boundaries. Lastly, there's policy-based compatibility. That's the weakest of the four tenets. The four tenets were um, thought up by uh, the Indigo team at Microsoft. Uh, they were first spelled out in a, a talk or a blog post by Don Box. Um, and um, that's the weakest of the four. Um, I'm not sure whether it actually deserves being there, but it talks about something interesting or something important. Uh, the behavior and the requirements for the edge are different from the message contract. That is a sense that requires explanation. You have message contract. Message contract meaning you're exchanging certain data. You send, a, you send someone a purchase order, uh, for instance, and you detail exactly how that purchase order is going to look. That's message contract. However, that definition, that contract, shouldn't really say anything 
of whether you need to use X509 or Kerberos uh, session tickets or a username and a password or something completely different to authenticate yourself against that service. Because that's really a decision of the people who are doing the deployment of your app. Right? This, it doesn't change anything if you, if you um, authenticate in a certain way or another way. So that's not really an intrinsic feature of your application. For your application, it's important that out of this infrastructure that you're using drops a security token, uh, or better yet, just you know, the Windows principle um, or the operating system principle to be, to be more general, that is set to uh, let you identify who's calling and all that other stuff is something you don't have to worry about as an application developer. The deployment people should do that. So policy here is saying that message contract should not be dependent on infrastructural concerns, meaning that there's a second element to, to contract, and that's policy. Policy means there's a set of rules there's, there's laid out, that's laid out, that's defined, and this set of rules drives the infrastructure around your application and adds all those dynamic concerns. So this is not something you are primarily concerned about as an application developer. Policy is a second contract, and that contract is designed for infrastructure people to negotiate, to agree on a common way to run the application. And authentication, the implementation of authentication is certainly an aspect of running the app. It's not an aspect of writing the app. Today, okay, if you're a systems programmer, sometimes you have to fiddle around with that stuff, right? But as an application level developer, you shouldn't be worried about whether you use Kerberos or X509. Because the typical application developer doesn't have the necessary skills to deal with Kerberos or X509 directly because they don't know security well enough. And of course, that's, of course, that's different in Israel because all of you guys work in secret facilities in your military time. <laughs> um, but in the rest of the world, in the rest of the world, that's certainly true. So those tenets map out to certain technologies. And I'm not yet over time. Well, I'm slightly over time. But that's okay, that was anticipated, wasn't it? Mapped out to technology. Remoting with .NET remoting. Take Java RMI, take any of your favorite current distributed te uh, systems technologies, including Kong. Is I shall be quiet about Kong for a moment. I'm going to come back to it. Is remoting policy driven? There's no sharing policy between the two ends of, and really there's nothing to share about remoting because remoting has no security. Well, it has now, there's a channel that if you dig deep enough in the Windows.NET 2 or SDK, you may find a, 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 a secure channel. Don't expect, it to be, don't expect it to be any fast or any powerful, but it's, there's one there. Explicit boundaries, no, of course not. Remoting says new object and you can't see anything, unless you go the hard path of really making it visible, which you can. Does it have, does it avoid coupling? Absolutely not, it's dependent on your build number uh, to make it compatible. Ex does it exchange metadata? That's debatable, there's a tool which lets you extract the contract, means the metadata of your assembly, into a separate isolated assembly tool it's called SOAP SUTS, and with that you could probably have something like metadata exchange, but that's not really true. ASP.NET version one, uh, and adding version two to that as well, via HTTP, policy driven? No, has no concept of a policy. Explicit boundaries? Yes, because you don't need the same code for client and server, which you need for remoting, which you need for enterprise services. Um, you have a, an explicit separation between the proxy and the server code, and actually there's no direct link between those two things. You have to generate whistle to generate the proxy. Do they avoid coupling? Yes, they're very tolerant. The client and proxy do not have to have the same version. They can actually have different data structures even. Um, and do they exchange metadata? Absolutely yes, they exchange whistle. ASP.NET Web Services with WYSI 2, and I should add WYSI 3, 
um, have all these capabilities. They also are based, they're based on exchangeable policy and you can drive, you can define a policy for the client portion and the server portion. You can sit down and negotiate that and then drive both infrastructures using that policy. Mind that, um, it requires an advanced science degree in XML to write the, the policy, but in theory, in theory, you can do that. It's no fun. If you do SOAP via SMTP, right, you just write your own thing, probably using WYSI, then yeah, the, all this infrastructure is going to be driven in the same way. If you just, if the yeah, application services text via SMS, <coughs> right, your own main thing, well then it's probably not policy driven, it does definitely have explicit boundaries, it does it avoid coupling, that depends on how you do it, and does it exchange metadata, well, not, not in a standardized way, at least. And HTML forms via, via HTP, HTTPS, not policy-driven, um, even though the authentication negotiation could be seen as something like this. Um, has excessive boundaries, and the rest avoids coupling exchanges metadata. <coughs> but the strong point here is, the, the, the real distinction here is remoting versus ASP.NET Web Services, in terms of following those tenets. You could see it as a philosophical, a philosoph a philosophical discussion, but we're going to point out more of those um, those things as we go along. So, confusion exists because I have used a slightly edited version of the tenet. Those of you who have followed this uh, will have noticed that I have not used the term autonomy as a standalone term. I've used autonomous teams, not autonomy. There's a guy who now works at Amazon who was working for a very, very long time at Microsoft. His name is Pat Hellens. Pat Hellens is a, a great guy in all respects. Uh, in body as much as uh, in, his, in his mental capacity. He's a very nice, friendly guy, and he has uh, he has invented uh, a principle <coughs> called um, the. Now I always, always always mix it up with uh, the, the the stolen definition by the other guy. Uh, fiefdoms and emissaries, exactly. Fiefdoms and emissaries is about building autonomous systems, and that's a very popular thing. It's also known as fortresses. Um, another guy, uh, whom I not, will not, not name to uh, protect the innocent, but some, some people are maybe known, um, has taken basically this Pat's concept, renamed it and sold it as its own, as its own and that's called Fortresses. And um, so this, this concept of autonomous systems is a oversimplification of the world, right? It's a great theory, but then Knowing Pat and his character, if, if you knew him, you would know that he's the guy who's, you know, makes a generalization and then wants everybody to believe in it, that's, that that's the only way. And that's just because he's so passionate about his stuff, right? It's not that it's, it's always necessary and necessarily the only thing, but he, he, is, he lives his things that he, that he invents. So that's... <coughs> you have to know that in addition to the, the theory to, to see it in the right way. So, but, Pat, being the genius that he is, has mm -hmm. a lot of fans. Especially also in Microsoft. Especially also in marketing. And all of these people went completely wild and overboard when seeing this definition. Policy, explicit boundaries, autonomy, country, and schema exchange. Versus the intent Policy explicit boundaries avoid coupling country and schema exchange because when they, they hear autonomy, it's the Pavlov dog reaction, right? They think pet health. They think autonomous computing. And that's where things get interesting. Up here, we have edges. The stuff that sits on the network edge and talks to us, 
right? Below the edge, we have internals. And then we have a data layer, maybe. And then we have data storage. We have all sorts of different concerns between the edge and the data store. Turns out autonomous computing is about data. Autonomous computing is very much about the data store. All of a sudden, this here, this term puts a dent between all the layers that we have and couples the architectural concern of keeping data right, of doing data right, with the edge concern of doing loose coupling. S suddenly we have this, 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 this putting together one thing with another thing which are basically unrelated, which shouldn't really be related. So can you write a non-autonomous service-oriented application? And the answer is absolutely yes. Do Achim and I think that autonomy helps writing good service-oriented applications? Yes we, yes, we do. But they made no mistake. If you take a 15-year-old piece of software, right, which has its issues, as every older software has. Um, yesterday at the, at the dinner table, we, um, I think Yossi said, um, software is, uh, older software is like an old man. Right? It doesn't walk as fast anymore. And I said, no, 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 it's like an old lady. It gets wrinkles. And, and that's, sort, that's, 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 sort, that's, that's sort of how it is. Right? It gets, old men get wrinkles too, right? To make that clear. And probably more, even, because they don't do anything about it. But it's, it's software gets, everybody's touching it. Oh, okay, no parallel to the ladies here in that part. <laughs> no, but everybody, everybody is, is just working on it, and there's people fixing stuff, and then people had this intent writing the code, and people are misunderstanding it. So it gets a little rough around the edges, and sometimes deep inside. And so it degenerates, and then there's no, even if there was a beautiful architecture in the beginning, it all just turns out to be a huge mess in the end. And that's, that's the same with, with, with everything, it seems because people cut corners, etc. So if you have software like this, putting a web service space on top of that existing app is a perfectly, perfectly reasonable approach to make it, accept, make it accessible for other applications <coughs> that turns it into a service-oriented app. Even if it's not autonomous and not modern and hasn't been developed using model-driven architecture and pretty pictures and DSLs and all those great things, it doesn't matter. If you have an old mainframe app, mainframe app and you can make you can extend its lifetime, right? You have a green screen mainframe app. I've heard those things still exist, right? And you want to take that that green screen app and want to expose it to the rest of the world, wrap it with uh, with the mainframe version of um, what's it called, WebSphere, expose it to the rest of the world. There's no reason to rewrite all that all that stuff. If it works, it's fine. I'm too pragmatic for you know, religiousness about uh, how an application shall be uh, architected to per be permitted to run on my network. Right? I don't care. If I write new software, that's a fine thing. But if I have existing software, I just want to make it run. There's no reason to re-architect it if it works. It turns out that if there's software that's 15, 20, 30 years old, there's a lot of wisdom in making those applications being architected well, because if you had only the computing resources of 15 years ago, you probably wrote an app that scales damn well, if it works in a large corporate environment. So, meant was this, that's, what's, that's what, what was being said, that's where all the confusion comes from. So, making peace between those two worlds, because the <laughs> autonomy people are there, and Achim is going to talk about Autonomy, autonomy later as well. Autonomous service means it's a software, so service means software entity that exposes functionality to outsiders, very general terms. The four tenets of service orientation are observed. Meaning, we're following the rules. Autonomous service is a superset of that, saying services control and hide their state, meaning they don't expose their state to outsiders. I'm just going to talk about it. Going to, going to tell you all about that. They don't trust outsiders. 
I was going to talk about that too. And serfs are alive <coughs> and do their own work, and that's an important that's an important point. Do not consider a service. Do not consider a server application or a component-based application a dead thing that only wakes up when you call it. That's the wrong way to look at it. There, you have a great deal of architectural <coughs> possibilities that you otherwise wouldn't have if you make your if you let your applications live. If you just assume that every application has has one thread at least on its own. Let's assume you have an inventory, uh, an inventory service, right? The inventory service invent manages your inventory. You can walk up to the service and say, imperatively, um, look, reserve me four books. I, would pro I will probably come and pick them up later. And then it can go, go around, can go shopping, maybe it finds another inventory which is closer to the shipping address, blah, blah, blah. And then it just takes the book from the preferred place and just never comes back to you. Never says, I don't need those books. Because you have an active component, you have a thread running, which after 15 minutes says, you know what, if you're not coming back, I'm, I'm dissolving your reservation. It's a real world thing, right? You go shopping, and the ladies know that. <coughs> you go shopping in the city, you see a nice pair of shoes, right? However, this is the first shop you go into. Right? You go to town, first shop, see a nice, nice pair of shoes. Current budget allows for one nice pair of shoes. That's what you need for, for, the, for the night. Being a shopper, right? It would be silly, it would be no fun to buy the shoes in the first shop, right? Never, never happens. Therefore, you will say, you know, can you hold them for me for a while, right? That's what you say. And then you go continue shopping, try another shoes, and that's how it works. And it takes four hours for no purpose because men would have said, all right, fine, let's go. <laughs> and then eventually you may return and the lady may return to the store and pick up the shoes, but it, she may just as well not and find something else somewhere else. And you can build systems based on those principles. Given that you have a shopkeeper, which is actually doing the cleanup work after you, uh, those systems tend to outscale a lot better than those who build on trust. That's a rarely trust outsiders thing, because the shopkeeper will actually keep the things for you, right? for an hour or two or three. But they won't trust you as much as to really keep them locked. If someone says, all right, I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna buy, gonna buy you know, uh, 20 euros extra, there you go. That's your risk. So, I will leave it at that. That's a, that's a great point to stop because all the slides that I'm, that I'm gonna have from this point onward is um, in this deck is stuff that we're going to cover anyways. Um, so with that, we're going to leave you into a 15-minute break. And after that, Achim is going to talk about edges. <laughs>